Morning everyone and welcome to this session bringing nature back through life. This session is uh, dedicated to, uh, to the LIFE, to the LIFE program, the key funding uh, instrument for nature conservation and restoration in Europe. My name is uh, Ben Delbar. I work with uh, NEMO for the European Commission and its executive agency uh, for SMEs, EASME, and I will be your host this morning. Outside is 13 degrees. It's grey, rainy and bird migration is in full swing. Inside, there's many of you sitting in front of computers or other devices, uh, joining from all over Europe and what I heard from the previous session, even from beyond, from the USA and maybe other countries as well. Welcome again. This session is dedicated to looking at the LIFE program, the LIFE funding program, and what it has achieved and is still achieving for nature conservation in Europe and for its precious species and habitats and all the benefits it provides to society. Uh, this comes obviously at an important time, as you've seen in the, in the Green Week and earlier this week with the launch of the State of Nature report uh, for the European Union, as well as this year's uh, adoption of the biodiversity strategy uh, for 2030. Um, and it's a good moment to look back and to assess a little bit, a little bit how the LIFE program has contributed to uh, the nature conservation achievements in Europe and how it can be improved. We have a full schedule today, an agenda, which uh, first starts with a presentation by Mr. Angelo Salci, head of the LIFE unit at EASME, and involved in, uh, in the LIFE program for, for, for many, many years. So he's the best place to, uh, to tell you uh, about, about LIFE and the key achievements. This will then be followed by four short testimonies we've chosen to have uh, beneficiaries, so life uh, recipients, um, to present uh, very briefly some of their project uh, results and, uh, and outcomes to showcase a bit the variety, which is obviously only a very small fraction of the many, many life projects that are implemented uh, across Europe. And after that, we'll have a question and answer session with, uh, with a panel with us. So uh, and, and, uh, at 11.45, the session will be automatically shut down. Um, we have indeed a set of panelists with us. Unfortunately, time does not allow to give them really the floor to give a presentation. But in the question and answer session, uh, we will have the, the possibility to, to hear and, and uh, see them. I'll just briefly introduce you to, uh, to the panelists. Apart from uh, Angelo Salsi, we have uh, with us Nicola Notaro. He's the head of the nature unit at the European Commission's DG Environment. and has also been uh, strongly involved in the biodiversity strategy uh, drafting and in uh, uh, just uh, leading also the session on protected areas, for example. We have with us Ariel Brunner, BirdLife International. He's uh, acting interim director as, as well as senior head of policy in Brussels and a, a long-standing beneficiary of, uh, of life projects, uh, BirdLife itself or its uh, members uh, across uh, across Europe. We have Tom Andries from the Flemish Agency for Nature and Forests and coordinator of the Belgian Nature Integrated Project, Life BNIP. And we have Wendy Olivier from the Netherlands Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality a LIFE national contact point in the Netherlands, also experienced for many years with, with LIFE. Then we have uh, four speakers who I will introduce when, uh, when we uh, come to the testimonies. I just uh, uh, want to, uh, before giving the floor to, to Angelo, highlight some of the technical instructions. Uh, as you see, obviously, we have a fully virtual session, unfortunately. Unfortunately, on the one hand, because we have no possibility to meet, but on the other hand, it does uh, provide more po possibility for people around Europe to, to participate in this session and to, to, uh, to post their questions. To post questions, you will, uh, you will see uh, a question mark on, the, on your screen, on the bottom right uh, of the screen. Uh, so type your questions uh, in there as from now during the entire session. Uh, we'll pick uh, questions from, from that list uh, in the question and answer session. 
if you have a question specifically addressing one of the, the panelists or speakers, please put their name in front of it. That uh, will help us in that as well. Um, another technical thing is if you wish to uh, display your screen full screen, there is a small icon on the bottom of, uh, of the page uh, screen with uh, arrows uh, pointing outwards. Click that and you have a full screen uh, uh, view. Um, so that, I think, is uh, as far as I need to uh, introduce you. I will give the floor now to Angelo for briefing us on the live program. Angelo, the floor is yours. Well, so let's take the helicopter and, uh, and fly through uh, 28 years of, uh, of life in 2004. Uh, we published uh, a brochure, a technical brochure, which was called uh, uh, Life for Natura 2000. It was the very first attempt to try to summarize uh, the results of the many years of the work of Life Nature uh, for the network Natura 2000. Now, 15 years after, we, we tried again with this uh, nice document called Bringing Nature Back Through Life, for which I want first to thank uh, our consultants in NEMO and in particular my colleague Silvia, who spent quite a lot of time uh, be, behind this document. Uh, so it's again an attempt to give you a uh, both an helicopter view of the forest, but at the same time also a dig down into the trees, uh, the single trees, to see what life has really achieved and not only nice words or a nice narrative about, uh, about the life problem. So let's... Uh, my task is to move slides as well. The first uh, slide shows you a very broad picture in terms of uh, the classical uh, uh, way we present financial programs. Uh, so the amount invested so far, three billions, uh, uh, a lot of money indeed, certainly not enough, but still. And uh, more than 1,800 projects uh, financed uh, so far. Uh, the, these projects, they helped us to target at least once 750 different species. Is that enough? Is that uh, not enough? That's obviously for you also to evaluate later on based on the document itself. And uh, you can have a, a small uh, look at this one. Uh, sorry for uh, this slide in which you find uh, the link. I hope it works, uh, but this link should drive you to the, uh, to the document itself. So what did we want to do with this uh, uh, this document? We wanted to the con assess the contribution of the projects in order to see whether they had changed in any way or improved the conservation status of habitats or species. We wanted to see what was the, the more local impact uh, and uh, we wanted also to analyze the added value for the citizens of uh, the European Union. And finally, which is the classical things that programs do, we wanted to showcase some best practices. Now let's go at some examples uh, at a broad level, uh, what you would call the, the, the impact uh, at uh, EU level. Uh, everybody uh, admits that uh, Natura 2000, which is the largest network <coughs> of uh, protected areas in the world, would not be the way it is without a little life program. So this is already a very summarized statement about what life uh, has achieved. We have financed uh, thousands of management plans. Uh, once you identify the sites, you have to decide what you do. And uh, since we're talking about 28,000 sites, uh, you would expect to have at least 28,000 management plans. Then uh, we have identified areas and helped to, uh, to um, uh, solve uh, problems related to identification of sites, in particular in the marine environment. Very difficult, very expensive, but Spain, with one single project managed to do a big leap forward in this, uh, in this particular task. And overall, we have been fin uh, targeting at least 5,400 Natura 2000 sites out of the 28,000, at least once during the time of life. Did we have an impact uh, on the conservation status of habitats and species? Of course we did. Uh, was it only life? Uh, Sometimes it was, uh, many other times we were just a catalyzer. We initiated the process that led to further financing from other programs or other initiatives, uh, which finally led to the change, the improvement in the conservation status. Still, we were essential uh, to improve conservation status uh, in 137 habitat types and 649 
speeches. Here you have some examples. I will not read it for you, but it's just uh, you will find the full uh, extent of uh, what was achieved in the in the document itself. And if you move from the broad level, the one that you would find in the reporting and the uh, and the and nature. Uh, status, uh, you uh, you can di div dive it into a more local or regional level, and that's probably where life is at its, its best. Why? Because we work by projects, and projects frequently identify a single place uh, on Earth or a single species or habitat, uh, and they try to solve the problem there, in that local context. And very many times they do achieve incredible results. Again, here, a very short list of, uh, of examples. And uh, uh, again, the question is always the same. Is that enough? Is that too little? Uh, when we will get to the next uh, big COP meeting on biodiversity, and we will once more probably admit that uh, we have not really succeeded uh, <clears throat> to the full extent we wanted in halting the loss of biodiversity or even reverting that, uh, we have at least a positive story to tell. For all these habitats and species, whether at local or at EU level, we can say that something happened. It happened, obviously, thanks to the good implementation of our policy and legislation, but it happened also because life, project after project, continued to uh, support this, uh, this implementation. This brings me on a, on a part of an, an aspect of life where I would like to spend one minute more is uh, the, the, the impact that life has on, uh, on humans, uh, in particular on human activities, ideas and, uh, and motivation. Life is a sort of a people's program. It gets down to the level really where we meet the very small group of people, sometimes shepherds, farmers, uh, researchers and so on, and we enable them to do what they were dreaming of doing. So we engage stakeholders, we improve the governance structure, so we have a very big effect in terms of capacity building. We have seen it again and again, almost at, uh, in every country. <clears throat> we have been front runners uh, in supporting the European Solidarity Corps uh, for volunteers, uh, in this case for Natura 2000. We have been able uh, to share the uh, and uh, facilitate the sharing of experiences and best practices uh, across project, but also in what we call the biogeographical seminar, which is a process directly linked to the policy implementation. And last but not least, we have been incredibly uh, powerful in uh, mobilizing money for the targets we are pursuing, typically through the integrated projects in, 2000, in the period 2014-2018. Just with 24 nature integrated projects, they have engaged in mobilizing more than a billion euros uh, uh, on top of the budget that we have provided them. The picture you see there is just a very tiny little example, but uh, the Choose Nature people will follow my presentation and they will give you a bit more details about all these nice uh, young people that have been volunteering for the European Solidarity Corps. Uh, our projects and our program, they do not only deliver on, uh, on specific uh, species and habitats uh, conservation, but by doing this, they provide uh, tons of different uh, co-benefits, like biodiversity is very well known to do, uh, whether this is climate change adaptation mitigation, combating invasive alien species, flood prevention, carbon sequestration, and last but not least, mental and physical health. And if we need that in this period probably you have uh, felt even physically how much we need a nice piece of green where we can get out from our little bubble at home after the lockdown and and just take a walk is it worth how much money is that worth who cares about the economic value of it as long as we have it and we can enjoy it the um, can we do Better, yes, of course, as every other human activity, we can improve, we can upscale what we are currently doing very well, sometimes at a local scale. We can do more in the marine areas uh, where we do invest a little bit too, too little. We can stimulate people to address species uh, that are your habitats that are sometimes uh, half forgotten, typically invertebrates and plant, minor plants uh, in the red lists. We can do more across border exchange and collaboration. And we can certainly publicize more the, the life achievements uh, to tell a positive story about uh, biodiversity. 
Let me finish with uh, a small uh, citation from uh, Laudato Si, uh, the encyclical that Pope Francis published uh, a few years ago. Uh, it says, in this case, uh, allow me to read it, because all creatures are connected, each must be cherished with love and respect. For all of us as living creatures are dependent on one another. So it gives you once again this feeling that the Pope wanted to uh, uh, send to us, we are living in a common home and we are part of this home. We are not the owner, we are not the, uh, the judge, we are just one tiny fraction of it. And uh, before this fraction disappears and my time is over, then uh, we, we really have to believe in this kind of uh, statements uh, and, uh, and change uh, our attitude towards the nature that uh, surrounds us and of which we are part. Thank you very much. And back to you, Ben. Thank you very much, uh, Angelo, uh, also for, uh, for bringing uh, the, the, the life uh, protection of, uh, of uh, nature, species and habitats in the wider context of people indeed and of uh, the value that the LIFE program has in, uh, in building this uh, community of uh, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people involved throughout Europe in, uh, in making, making it all happen. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I uh, give the floor now to the, the, the first testimony. So uh, one of the life beneficiaries uh, uh, that has uh, been involved in many life projects so far. The first one is uh, the JIP Connect uh, program. Life JIP Connect is a program funded by the European Union to save the bearded vulture. It started in September 2015 and it will end in November 2021. Ligue pour la protection des oiseaux, BirdLife France, is coordinating a partnership of eight associated beneficiaries. Life Jeep Connect aims to restore the connection between the Alpine and Pyrenean population of bearded vultures. In 1986, the first reintroduction program was launched by four countries, Austria, Sweden and Italy and France. In 2015, Life Jeep Connect means to bridge the persistent gap between native population of the Pyrenees and reintroduce population from the Alps. Nowadays, the main threat to its survival are lack of food, illegal use of poison bats, habitat destruction and degradation, illegal persecution, disturbance, and collision with power lines. Live Jeep Connect is targeting all these threats. From 2016 to 2020, 34 birds were released. Three territorial pairs are installed in the area of the program. Movements of released birds were observed between Alps, Massif Central, and Pyrenees. We also improved their food resources with the creation and implementation of 22 farmer natural recycling stations and 7 supplementary stations. To avoid collision with electrical network, dangerous power lines were mapped in Grand Coast and in Baroni, and more than 50 km of dangerous power lines were secured or neutralized. To avoid collision with wind farm, a mapping catalog of the bearded vulture issues were created alongside guidelines and rules to coexist. To prevent poisoning, more than 100 necropsies were realized during the project and complaints are systematically filed by life partners for shooting and poisoning. We are also conducting an experiment with more than 50 volunteers trying lead-free ammunition. More than 1,300 hunters were sensitized about this issue. We are also raising awareness among stakeholders and the general public, following a sociological study realized in 2017. A set of tools were created. Our project makes us proud because it enhances the chance of survival of the bearded vultures in Europe and in the world. It is also one of our best examples of successful cooperation with stakeholders. Grande
It seems that uh, the video uh, projection uh, is a bit interrupted, so I'm, uh, I'm very sorry for that. Uh, but I hope you uh, have been able to get a flavor of uh, of this uh, project about the bearded filter in France and, uh, and Southern Europe uh, more widely, showing actually how persistent uh, project implementation uh, for many years has achieved great recovery of, uh, of one of Europe's uh, key uh, birds of prey uh, through the through the live program. I give the floor now then to uh, to the next uh, project, which is an integrated project, the Life IP Intimares. The floor is to uh, you, Victoria. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me to explain briefly the contribution of the Life Integrated Project Intermaris to nature conservation in the EU. Uh, main contributions can be summarized in these two political messages. Both of them are an integral part of the EU Biodiversity Strategy 2030. First, Intermaris is the tool used by the Spanish government to move towards 30% protection of the sea by 2030. Marine protected surface has reached 12% in Spain, and a roadmap for enlargement is being elaborated with the scientific community on the basis of the analysis of shortcomings of the current Natura 2000 network at sea. Second, Intermaris is setting the basis for a new approach to the management of the marine environment, with scientific knowledge and stakeholder participation as basic tools for decision making. What are the main what are the main components of this new approach? How is Intermaris progressing? First, increasing scientific knowledge on its values and functioning. 16 oceanographic campaigns have been carried out in marine areas to improve knowledge on habitats and species. Second, addressing governance and reinforced administrative coordination. Testing a governance strategy in pilot sites to improve marine governance together with a guide to participatory processes. Third, integrating managers and stakeholders. Since the beginning in 2017, more than 7,000 people and 800 organizations have been involved in participatory processes. And fourth, fulfilling training and capacity building needs. More than 13,000 people from public administrations have been trained, including the Marine Civil Guard and the Navy. Also, Intermares is implementing a successful system uh, of integration of funds for the conservation of marine biodiversity, with annual mobilizations from the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund and the European Social Fund, as well as national funds managed by the Biodiversity Foundation. To date, more than 200 projects have been financed to complement Intermares objectives. Finally, Intermaris is being carried out thanks to a diverse and unique partnership of managers, marine scientists, NGOs, and representatives from the fisheries sector under the coordination of the Biodiversity Foundation of the Ministry for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge, and thanks to the support of the LIFE program of the European Union. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, to give uh, this uh, brief uh, overview of, of the Intermaris integrated projects. Uh, for those of you not familiar with this type of project, it's a, it's a novelty from the latest uh, uh, life uh, program uh, to, to scale up uh, the, the, the work on nature conservation to national level or regional level for a more strategic approach towards implementing and developing Natura 2000 uh, and uh, the, the Nature Directive, so the integrated projects. And Life Intermaris is one of of the, the few tens of uh, IPs in, in Europe uh, working on that. I now give the floor to a, a completely different type of project, which focuses on volunteer involvement. Uh, here's the floor to choose nature. I'm Bretton23 and I'm a volunteer of the communication group. 
The Life Choose Nature project was born from the life call of 2016, a different call from the usual that wanted to support projects uh, that involved young volunteers uh, to participate in projects uh, or volunteer work in projects in their own country or abroad. Um, The European Solidarity Corps is the European Union initiative which creates opportunities for young people to work to volunteer. What's happening? Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the technical problems. Uh, so, uh, the European Solidarity Corps is the European Union initiative which creates opportunities for uh, young people to volunteer or to work um, uh, in uh, their own country or abroad. Participants could join a wide range of uh, projects such as uh, helping to prevent natural disasters uh, or rebuild afterwards uh, um, or assisting in centers for asylum seekers uh, or in our case uh, uh, to protect the sample spaces uh, and uh, raise awareness among local populations. LIPU, the Italian partner of Good Life, uh, was the only beneficiary of the project uh, with the financial support of Caribro Foundation. Uh, the Free Air project ended last August. Uh, wanted to involve the 310 young volunteers aged between 18 to 30 years old who are part of the European Solidarity Corps. We made the recruitment uh, through uh, sponsored posts on Instagram and Facebook uh, which reached 9.6 million uh, young people falling within the target and uh, we recruited more than 400 young volunteers. We decided to create 20 groups in 11 Italian regions that could defend six different bird spaces, particularly protected by the, uh, the birds directive, such as Kentish Plova, White Stork, Bonelli Seagulls, uh, Eleonora's Falcon, and so on, as well as three groups formed to intervene in case of environmental disasters, uh, in particular hydrocarbon spills into water. And finally, a group that could uh, amplify and uh, support the communication of the project. Uh, overall, the young volunteers dedicated over 65,000 hours to volunteer activities. Uh, although it wasn't the classic conservation project, the results, the results uh, achieved are also remarkable in terms of conservation. For example, our volunteers monitored 12% uh, uh, of the Italian population of Kentish Plova, uh, or 60% of West Stork, uh, or 12%, 20% of uh, uh, Bonelli Eagles, and 13% of Eleanor's Falcon. Other important actions were the online and on the field training, the awareness and the information work that uh, these young volunteers carried out. I recommend everyone to participate in activities and experiences like this because nature has changed my life and I'd like to thank the LIFE program for making this possible and thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Greta, for for this uh, insight in, uh, into a, a different aspect, indeed, from uh, from uh, from life, focusing really on building this community, and uh, and great to see the young generation stepping in and uh, and taking over the 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 role of uh, of uh, moving forward with nature conservation with impressive numbers of reaching out to millions of Europeans uh, to to get engaged in this in this cause. Fantastic, uh, fantastic work. Um, uh, I understand there is a, a, a technical problem with the next uh, presentation. We had a, a testimony foreseen for the Irish peat bogs uh, project. 
looking at a, again a different type of project apart from the the species conservation that we've we've seen with the, the bearded vulture and the integrated project and now uh, with the choose nature on uh, volunteer involvement uh, we had a, a presentation foreseen on uh, peatland restoration but apparently there's a technical issue that uh, is cannot be resolved at this stage clearly technology will not save us so uh, let's go for nature-based solutions instead um, that means that I will open the floor for, for questions. I see a few questions come in. Don't be shy. Uh, please post your questions in the chat box and we will pick up uh, some of them from there. Let me start with a first question, which I think is uh, for Angelo Salsi. Um, Ilya Neudecker says, it's good to hear about the successes of life for nature. Would you also be able to mention some failures or mistakes? Because that's what we can learn most from. So, Angelo, would you have any examples of elements where you feel that uh, there's room for improvements? Yeah, plenty of them. <laughs> the, one of probably of the major failures, uh, uh, I guess that you, uh, the question refers to, to, to life uh, is uh, is the fact that we were not able really to attract uh, those people who could uh, uh, intervene in the less visible biodiversity, the one that composes uh, the vast majority either of the mass of the biodiversity, but also of the numbers of, uh, of species. Uh, this refers to soil biodiversity, hidden biodiversity in the format of invertebrates, uh, mollusks, and, uh, and so on. And the second biggest failure is the failure of life. Uh, yeah, partially we can uh, we can assume part of it. Uh, we have done, I think, quite an effort uh, trying to make the um, life environment uh, uh, welcome for these kind of initiatives, but we still have very very few. Uh, the second one is I mentioned in, uh, in the marine environment, but this is not really only a failure of life. I think it's a failure jointly of the many. Uh, financial programs uh, that could support uh, this particular area, whether this is the marine uh, program uh, at the EU level, the research program, the life program, and so on. It's one of those areas where investments are, uh, they multiply by tenfold uh, compared to working on land, and there you have to join forces. Uh, you cannot do it alone with uh, uh, an instrument like life or any other. So I think that uh, these are two potential possible examples. Uh, there are more, but I would stop here. Thank you, uh, Angelo. That's indeed uh, a good addition. Indeed, uh, life uh, has, has focused mostly on, on those species and habitats listed in the in the nature directives. Uh, but uh, as you said, there is much more biodiversity out there with the example of biodiversity uh, uh, in the soil, uh, as, you, as you've given, so much more work to be done there. I see other questions coming in. I think uh, relating also to, to uh, what we heard yesterday uh, with the presentation, uh, with the opening presentation and earlier this morning about uh, the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. Um, what what uh, could the could life program contribute to helping to implement this uh, this biodiversity strategy? What could be a specific role for for life to make things happen uh, that uh, would not have uh, happened in the in the previous uh, rounds? That I think is a question for Nicola Nicola Notaro, please. Yes, uh, thank you for, for the question and uh, good morning to all. Uh, well, life, of course, uh, can play a very important role in the implementation of the biodiversity strategies with um, uh, continuation of actions that um, it has already been supporting for a number of years and also in terms of new action. Uh, if you think of the um, uh, target for protected areas uh, increase in the biodiversity strategy, the idea of reaching 30% of protection for our land and our sea and strict protection for 10% of that, uh, of course, um, uh, life can continue to provide uh, a large amount of support as uh, 
It has been the case in the past, and Angelo has referred in his presentation uh, to the number of sites which have been uh, uh, financially supported by life projects. He has given example of uh, protected habitat and species. And then we, of course, uh, uh, saw also the big project of Intermares, the integrated project, uh, which helped a lot uh, Spanish authorities increasing their uh, national network of protected areas in the marine. And uh, obviously, this is the type of work that is um, still necessary and uh, uh, should go on in terms of supporting the achievement of the protected areas target. But um, in addition to that, there is a new dimension and a stronger dimension in the uh, biodiversity strategy, which uh, covers essentially the issue of restoration. And uh, there we, we are planning to develop uh, uh, legally binding targets for restoration. And I see a, a major role, of course, for restoration uh, projects um, to be supported by LIFE. Of course, LIFE has already supported and we've seen examples of restoration in the past, but uh, there are also possibilities, for instance, through the strategic nature projects uh, uh, to upscale such uh, uh, restoration activities, uh, including by teaming up uh, with uh, other European funds and then uh, providing a much uh, bigger portfolio of funds to support an individual project. Uh, we've had some very good examples of that also through the life integrated project so far. And I hope that this can be multiplied uh, uh, in the future through the strategic nature projects. And um, while the focus today is on life and nature, I, I think that uh, we should not underestimate the connections uh, between uh, different envelopes of the LIFE Fund, which have actually supported nature outside the uh, nature dedicated envelope and will continue to do so. And I'm thinking in particular of um, uh, the environment part, of course, where water projects can be financed. Uh, I, I just uh, uh, refer to one of the targets um, uh, for restoration, uh, which is uh, restoring 25,000 kilometers of rivers in Europe, uh, included in the biodiversity strategy. I uh, could imagine a significant uh, contribution of uh, life um, to the implementation of this target, for instance. And also the other envelope, uh, which is related to climate change. Because of course, uh, um, uh, the one of the priorities for restoration activities, uh, nature restoration activities will also be to uh, restore, uh, protect and restore um, uh, soils which are carbon rich so that we can contribute to both the uh, goals of climate change policy and the goals of biodiversity policy. And of course, the adaptation dimension, for instance, when you restore floodplains, uh, wetlands uh, uh, that uh, help greatly to mitigate uh, extreme uh, weather events. Uh, so there's a lot of room for life uh, to support uh, the strategy uh, by doing more of the same and uh, maybe also some newer uh, activities and also um, uh, upscaling some of these uh, thanks in particular to the uh, strategic nature project which I think will be essential to mainstream um, uh, life uh, uh, such success into other funds and create more joined up um, uh, financial support. Thank you, uh, Nicola, for this uh, this uh, reply, and indeed also for for mentioning uh, another novelty coming up in the in the next round of uh, of the life program, which is the strategic nature projects, the SNAPs, which is uh, perhaps this, the the next level after the the integrated projects, uh, and indeed, as you rightly say, a tool that uh, that likely will help mainstream biodiversity and the role of life into other policy sectors. So I would like to give the floor to, to Wendy Olivier from a national uh, public authority to see uh, how, how uh, this, this LIFE program and, and this process can help uh, implement national policies for nature, but also perhaps uh, for water or other uh, policy areas. So Wendy, what, uh, what uh, do you see as the role of LIFE in that perspective? Wendy, we don't hear you. Uh, do you have your microphone unmuted? I now have my microphone unmuted. 
Yes, hello, I'm Wendy Oliver from the Netherlands, National Contact Point. And um, we in the Netherlands are very uh, fond of the live IP uh, category in life. And we use it uh, indeed to um, to look if we can work more together with other functions in public space uh, to achieve better the Nature 2000 uh, goals, aims. And uh, Live IP gives us uh, a kind of a circle of influence in other policies areas uh, also to to make other policy areas or the owners of other, other policy areas um, uh, partner in uh, a coalition we uh, create through life. And um, yeah, you can, you can work better together with each other because you bring uh, the EU with you, uh, you bring some money with you, and you can, um, you, you bring a vision. And so, yeah, I don't know if that's what you an answer on your question, Ben. Yes, thank you, uh, Wendy. Indeed, uh, as you say, uh, life life apparently helps uh, making connections between various policy fields and and uh, putting uh, putting nature in a wider vision, a wider perspective, and then strategy. So uh, thanks for that. Um, I. I Take a, a question now from uh, from again from the from the chat box, which is specific for one of the presentations uh, we've we've heard about Tuna, about Choose Nature project and the involvement of volunteers. Uh, Anna asked, "Did you find it easy to reach that many young people, and how did you do it?" Greta or Massimo, can you reply, please, and please unmute. It's not very easy at all to reach so many young people. Uh, we invested a lot of energy and results in the organization of the communication, and uh, we involved uh, professional uh, uh, teams for making this possible and for reach so many young people, uh, also through the social medias uh, such as Facebook and Instagram. And we worked uh, a lot of uh, also uh, on the engagement of uh, our uh, of our posts uh, uh, and the strategies, communication strategies. Thank you very much, uh, Greta, for this uh, for this addition. Um, let me go to to uh, to a, another question, which I think many of you could could help answer. But I will uh, I will pass this one to Tom Andries uh, from BNIP, uh, partly because uh, BNIP last year organized uh, a platform meeting for integrated projects, which included also spreading of lessons learned. Uh, there's a question from Ilya Neudecker. How do you spread lessons learned, the capacity built, so that there is wider benefits for the whole of the EU, its nature, and its citizens? Uh, so, Tom, may I give you the floor? Thanks. Thank you, Ben, for this question. Um, well, investing in capacity building is, is quite essential, and also in, in sharing all the experience uh, gained within a project. And thanks to these live IPs, you can also have a lot of uh, flexibility to adapt your program, your project as well, to meet uh, in the best possible ways this uh, this issue. So, uh, but it, it, it still is very difficult, especially for Natura 2000, to um, raise awareness among the, the general public. Uh, it's it's a, a problem that we also discussed during our platform meeting and for which we do not have a clear answer unless you really have a very broad uh, communication campaign all across of, over Europe, but that would be a very expensive campaign. So that's why we're also focusing, I think, in most of the IPs on uh, capacity building and knowledge sharing and communication towards stakeholders. 
Uh, it's also linked, of course, what is what has been mentioned earlier, mainstreaming biodiversity into other policies. Then it's very essential uh, to get your stakeholders involved uh, as well. I hope this uh, answers a little bit your question. Thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, it, it does indeed, uh, to, uh, to a large extent, uh, answer it. But perhaps uh, maybe Angelo could could add something uh, about it as well in terms of uh, the, the the wider EU level and how uh, capacity building is is taken care of and how actually the lessons learned from life are spread through uh, through other parties and for more engagement. Angelo, may I ask you? A uh, short reply or half an hour uh, narrative? I guess you want a short reply. The, uh, the, the short reply is that we have uh, many different tools by which we try to indeed uh, engage the people in sharing knowledge uh, and make sure that this knowledge is, uh, is built in uh, and, uh, and used. Uh, the most powerful one is the one where we ask the projects at the very beginning, so at the level of the proposal and, and later on when we finance them, uh, we insist on this, that they replicate. So that if they do something, a specific action that can be transferred or replicated in another place, location or, or sector with another actor, that they do it. And, uh, and I can tell you that the projects now, they have learned a lesson and they, they're doing this. Uh, so some people call it catalytic effect. Uh, I simply call it doing again, learning from the others and, uh, and, and using the, the results. When I mention the capacity building effect, it's a very old feature of, of life. I always mention the example of Greece. Uh, I could mention another country. In the 90s, in Greece, uh, you would take an NGO, there were a few dealing with nature, and ask them uh, to organize a, an event, a conference, they would do it. Ask them to run a 1 million euros uh, projects on the ground, they would not be able to do it. They simply didn't have the staff and the resources. Nowadays in Greece, you have several NGOs that can carry on their shoulders millions of euros worth projects. So this is also the long-term legacy that the life is leaving behind itself, project after project. And then there are more, but I mean, we said short reply, so let's say short. Very much, uh, Angelo, uh, because that uh, the, the the link and uh, keeping it short is, is nice because it gives the opportunity for for giving the floor to Ariel. Because uh, Angelo, you mentioned the need to roll of NGOs and uh, long track records and and, and uh, uh, repeating and, and expanding and building capacity. And I think uh, uh, Ariel, from the bird life perspective, being involved for many years in projects, could you say something about? Uh, about the, 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 the greater impact uh, for birds and nature in general that, that life uh, can, can achieve through, uh, is achieving through this kind of uh, repetition. Ariel, please. Ariel, please unmute. I'm not sure if we uh, still have uh, Ariel with us. Uh, apologies for that. Um, I will uh, then uh, go to the to the related question, perhaps uh, from from the floor. Julia Testa asks: Is life involved in any rewilding projects that involves large carnivores or predators? I think that's a question. The rewilding relates a bit to uh, to elements of the biodiversity strategy for 2030, uh, and the question relates to uh, projects within nature with the, within the current life uh, portfolio. Uh, can I first give the floor to uh, to Nicola in relation to uh, to the ambitions of the biodiversity strategy in this respect? Thank you, Ben. Um, I don't think I'm well placed to tell you about the life projects uh, specifically on rewilding. Maybe Angela and colleagues uh, 
no more about that. But um, if you your question relates more generally to uh, what is the place of rewilding within the biodiversity strategy, I would say that uh, rewilding is not per se the focus uh, of the, the strategy. And uh, however, um, uh, there is a component which is related to that, and it's. Uh, uh, the strategic, uh, sorry, the strict protected area um, uh, target. I mentioned before that there is an overall target of uh, designation of 30% uh, of EU land and 10% uh, uh, of this should be um, indeed strict protection. The same applies to the sea. Uh, of course, uh, there is often an overlap between the areas to be subject of strict protection and uh, uh, wilderness uh, areas, because generally these are the areas where ecological processes uh, need to be left uh, undisturbed and um, uh, therefore human activities are generally uh, excluded at least to large extent or at least the uh, extractive activities. Uh, now in that respect, um, an area which is not strictly protected and not uh, uh, wild uh, as such today could be restored, rewilded uh, and uh, indeed uh, become subject of uh, uh, strict protection. And in that respect, I see a connection between uh, rewilding approaches and um, uh, the targets on restoration uh, under the uh, biodiversity strategy and then the target on protected areas, because once you have restored uh, areas, of course, you need to ensure that they remain uh, legally protected for the future. So these two components, uh, um, future possible binding restoration targets that we want to develop under the strategy and the protected areas target, they both uh, have a relationship with the strict, uh, with the rewilding um, uh, aspects. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for this uh, for this addition. And uh, indeed, as you said uh, before, uh, the live program has already perhaps uh, uh, made the the fundament for the restoration activities of uh, of the ambitious ambitions of the of the new uh, biodiversity strategy. Um, I will I will just uh, refer to the to the impact study that uh, Angelo has, has presented. In there, there's many examples of large carnivores and and. Uh, predators uh, and the successes that uh, that life has achieved in that respect so i will not uh, continue on that rather i would like to point to uh, an additional question that came into angelo uh, on a on an aspect that we haven't covered yet which is the underrepresentation of the marine environment uh, from the state of nature report we uh, heard already that uh, there's much unknown in the marine uh, but uh, perhaps, Angelo, you can uh, say a bit more about uh, the reasons behind the relative underinvestment in marine conservation and restoration projects. Thanks. Ben, uh, the uh, marine environment. Before the marine environment, let me compliment the reply by Nicola. Uh, in the application guidelines for life, uh, since I think more than five years, we explicitly mentioned the rewilding uh, element as uh, one of the features uh, or the type of actions uh, that the applicants have to take into consideration. And we have already financed several projects that deal with uh, rewilding, both in the southern part of Europe, but also in other parts of Europe. And the marine part, I think the reasons are uh, manifold, but I would mention two. One I already mentioned before in my introductory speech is the sheer cost of uh, actions uh, at sea. Uh, so moving a, a boat from the harbor into the sea uh, is not the same thing as uh, going into a forest and, uh, and felling a tree or uh, eradicating an alien species. They are both uh, challenging uh, activities and they are both costly, but uh, the one at sea is uh, you have to multiply it by a factor. And, uh, and this alone, if you just uh, surf at the, uh, at the surface of the sea, but if you start diving into the sea and you start going down in the, in the deep part of the sea, uh, the, the cost uh, simply explodes. So there is a problem of cost. This is one thing. The second one, which is probably even more acute, I would say, is that in the marine environment, the number of people and uh, equipments that we have available to, uh, 
implement activities, conservation activities, is far more limited than on the terrestrial ground. Already the nature conservation sector is not like building highways. You cannot simply throw in money and they will build the number of highways that you want. It's a finite, uh, uh, confined, if you want, context in, that grows steadily every year. A few more people make a living out of nature conservation and biodiversity protection, but still it's a rather limited uh, sector. In the marine sector, this you find it even more uh, evident. And obviously these two factors, the, the cost uh, and, the, and the limited number of uh, people and time at the end of the day that you have available, uh, that determines, I think, uh, to a large, a large extent, the fact that we have lesser, less projects. Uh, can we do something about it? Uh, first, be patient, like everything, and continue to invest in this particular sector and continue to stimulate the people. And then hopefully uh, seeing uh, that together with the blue growth, we will also have a growth of the conservation sector at, uh, at sea. Thank you, uh, Angelo, uh, indeed to, to give some insight in the, in the financial aspect of, uh, of why certain choices are made or why certain investments are, are made. Uh, and clearly for, for the marine environment, uh, that's more demanding than for, for terrestrial, as you, as you indicate. Um, but perhaps making a, a link to another question and, and the last one, I'm afraid, because we're uh, approaching the end of this session. Uh, Inga Rasinska asks, uh, given the damaging decision on the cap uh, by the European Parliament yesterday, do you think that life alone can save nature without a contribution from the cap? Perhaps you can widen that, uh, that question to can, can life uh, work uh, alone without contribution of uh, for other policies? Uh, so is this something that I can pass on to Nicola, please, uh, for the last uh, reply last question in this session. Thank you, Nicola. Hi, Ben. Uh, yes, well, uh, I think we need to digest a little bit uh, the decisions taken yesterday in the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament uh, on, the, on the CAP and see what are the concrete effects and uh, the position of the two institutions are only now the basis for negotiations uh, between the co-legislators uh, um, uh, until the finalization of the proposals. But uh, the answer is uh, no, life alone cannot save uh, nature or biodiversity. That's clear. It's, uh, it's not its purpose, but um, it can facilitate a lot uh, integration of um, uh, the policy objective of nature and biodiversity also in other uh, funding instruments at EU level. And I think we should uh, try and exploit uh, its entire potential in that uh, in that respect, and um, uh, then I, I think that um, uh, legal text, uh, um, of course, extremely important. But there is also the um, uh, what matters a lot is the political willingness of what uh, uh, member states governments want to do with them. So we will see what the final legal text of the common agricultural policy for the next financial period will be. And uh, uh, after that, we will have to uh, really work on um, uh, making sure that there is political commitment to use them uh, um, in the best way for the environment and for the delivery of the objectives of the Green Deal, in which, uh, in principle, everyone agrees, including in Council and uh, uh, in the European Parliament. Thank you, uh, Nicola, for that uh, for that addition. Indeed, and indeed, there's a, a, a quite a, an important role that that life can play, uh, linking up to to previous answers as well in building more capacity, in being heard, and in, uh, in making sure that the, the role that life can play is uh, is effectively in, uh, included in other policies or integrated in other policies and mainstreamed as one of the the buzzwords. Before uh, closing the session, let me point you to the to the life website. Uh, where actually uh, the report that was uh, launched today is uh, is available, apart from many other publications. Obviously, there's contact information for if you want to have more more questions uh, addressed, uh, you can contact uh, through through the Life website. Share the the news through the the, the social media that are uh, listed here on the on the screen, and perhaps most importantly, uh, check how you can submit a Life project and. Uh, uh, 
uh, kind of stimulate others uh, as well to submit uh, live projects, check us what is possible and uh, how to go about it. And do not shy away in, in uh, making uh, large coalitions. Perhaps referring to what uh, Director General yesterday said, um, uh, be inspirational and bring ideas for upscaling. So actually uh, just saying life's what you make it. Thank you all for participating in the session. Thanks all for helping make it uh, a success, uh, all my colleagues. So, uh, and don't forget to visit the live stand in Exhibition Hall 2 and the live award ceremony this evening uh, in this session. Thank you.